Hi everyone, Micah with Movie Maker Magazine here. Today I got a chance to talk to director Joe Ray on his new movie, Cyrano. This one was really exciting for me because I'm a huge fan of Joe Wright's debut film in 2005, Pride and Prejudice. Like, a really big fan. I even made a video essay about it. We got a chance to talk about finding meaning within his shot choices, the intentionality behind a lot of the choices he made. Also, we got a chance to talk about crafting his iconic character-driven wonners. I really hope you guys enjoy this conversation as much as I did, because I loved it. You could have directed directed any adaptation, any script of Cyrano. What was it about this one that made you want to direct it? Peter Dinklage. <laughs> um, when I I was invited by Haley Bennett to go and watch a um, uh, the first night of a small workshop production uh, that she was doing up at the um, Chester Theatre in Connecticut. And I went along, uh, excited to see Haley's performance. Uh, I'm a great admirer of hers. And, um, and I knew that Pete was in it um, and I was excited to see Pete. And I knew the story and loved the story. Um, I admired its cleverness um, and I admired its wit. And I, as a teenager, felt quite um, uh, understood by the character of Cyrano, someone who feels unworthy of love. Um, and then, um, and then the show started, and then on came Peter, and then Peter brought with him his entire life experience, and then to see him and Haley together on stage, and and this kind of the impossibility, and yet the perfection of this love between these two outwardly different but inter internally akin spirits and um, and I was just incredibly moved it was it was the first time that I'd ever really felt the full emotional impact of the story and I felt that this was something that I wanted to learn about investigate um, bring to an audience um, as truthfully and as um, uh, honestly as possible. Back when you were doing Atonement, there was a great quote I, I remember hearing in the behind the scenes, or it may have been even in the commentary where you were talking about that there are hundreds of different versions of adaptations that could happen based on the audience or whoever is directing it. How is this a Joe Wright film? I don't know, it's impossible to say. It's like saying, how am I who I am? You know, I don't, um, it's very difficult to, to answer that question, being inside me and inside my, my work. Does that make sense? It's, it's yeah, like, yeah. um, uh, but I, I hope the film has no irony, um, and no cynicism. And I set out to make a film devoid of those two characteristics and yet still believe, maintain its intelligence. And I think sometimes um, irony and cynicism in our modern world are confused for intelligence. Um, but to me, they don't have the monopoly on intelligence. There is an intelligence that is trusting and kind and compassionate. Um, and, and I hope that comes across in the movie. I would be proud if it did. Um, and uh, and I hope that that was certainly an intention of mine. Um, uh, but I but I still hold on to this idea that there are as many versions of the film as there are viewers of it. And one of the things I try to do with my movies is allow space for the participation of the audience's imagination. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like I like to think about your wonders from Pride and Prejudice, especially the the Netherfield Ball one, where like just each character has just like a tiny moment in each one. If you miss it, yeah. like you miss it. But if you go back, you see it again. I've seen that movie too many times. I apologize. I promise I won't bring it up again. <laughs> when directing performances on set, was there a big difference in directing singing performances and dancing performances? Um, no, because you're always trying to um get to the intention of the character at any given moment um and so 
the kind of reoccurring question that I asked myself and the cast was about human connection, was about who's trying to connect with who, who are they, are they achieving connection or are they failing to achieve connection? And if they're not connecting, then why are they not connecting? Um, uh, always questioning that, that, that theme of connection, um, which I find it very useful uh, to have, you know, with, with Darkest Hour, for instance, um, the, one of the central themes of the movie was doubt. Um, I had a post-it note, you know, always on the monitor that said doubt. Um, in what way is this scene about doubt? Who's doubting who? Um, is he doubting himself? Is it? And so I find that really useful. And for me, this movie was about human connection and the failure to connect and who is connecting with who. Mm -hmm. So, so each each scene that you you. Mm, okay, now 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 I'm thinking about all those scenes in my head. One of my favorite shots in this movie, by the way, was um, the scene where um, Cyrano starts writing, and there's like this one like I don't know how to describe it, but like it's like a split screen shot between Haley, Peter, and um, and the guy who played Christian. And I was like, oh, I I remember saying I told my girlfriend about it later. It's like I felt like a threesome shot. And I, yeah. <laughs> it's like they're all just kind of intertwined the, together, and I love that. The the that uh, that that excites me that you uh, received that because that was the intention. Yeah. Um, the intention with that song and 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 in specifically those shots um, was to create a kind of menage a trois between three people who are never in the same room. Um, so there there is a kind of scene where you're going okay. Um, uh, how do we convey who's connecting with who and are they connecting and how do we convey that connection? Um, and finally, the kind of the the accumulation, the 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 the, the climax uh, of that connection comes in that kind of triptych shot. I love the way you uh, you play with free with framing in your film, too. Like, I really like that when um, uh, Peter's character of Cyrano is when he's at his best, he is very equal in frame with almost anyone in the movie, except for when, you know, obviously things start to go badly for him. Um, and I was wondering if you can talk about like, how, how when you're directing, when you're, when you're looking for that core idea of connection, how does that play into the way you frame your characters? Well, you're always taking on the, 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 the environment, the set, the characters, the actors, their physical um, attributes. Um, and so obviously, you know, um, there's a height difference between Pete and, and Roxanne. Um, and so it was interesting to play with that. Uh, for instance, in the bakery scene, um, uh, when uh, she's beginning to tell him that she's in love with somebody and that he thinks that person is him, I specifically had her sitting lower than him and him above her. Um, he's bigger than her, he's taller than her at that moment. He's feeling um, uh, powerful and in control and things are wonderful. Um, and the moment that breaks, she stands up and he's revealed once more um, uh, to be uh, not as tall as she. Um, and so one's playing with scale, I suppose, um, and playing with um, uh, playing with the form and the structure in a way of a shot to create meaning. Yeah, I, and I think you do it absolutely wonderfully. Um, so I want to talk about your use of sound in this film, because I noticed it was a few times um, when the musical number was about to start there was almost like a tunnel effect of the sound that would go and then and the music would start. I was wondering like, since it's your first musical, like what what kind of sound choices did you have to make that were different from your normal movies? Normal movies, um, from your other movies, I'm sorry. Uh, um, well, all of the singing was recorded live on set. Um, and I I did that to create a kind of, 
intimacy. I wanted a kind of seamlessness between speech and song. I wanted uh, a character to be able to speak into song without taking a breath. Um, that the, 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 the singing form would be as natural as breathing, as speaking, as laughing or crying. Um, and so to that end, we, we recorded the, the singing live. And also because I liked the, the cracks in the voices. I liked the faults. Um, mm. Humanity seemed to be carried through in faults rather than in perfection. Um, and so that, that was interesting to me. Um, and then what I also did was make sure that the sound, you know, often in musicals, um, uh, a song starts and all other sounds other than music and, and, and vocals is faded out. Uh, but I wanted the world to carry on while the singing was happening. So we made sure that all of the small sound effects, the spot effects, all of those kind of effects uh, continued, but became part of the music. So the music wasn't just made up of violins and cellos and the guitars or whatever, but also was made up of birdsong and footsteps and uh, uh, and um, in the distance a donkey or, a, you know, um, uh, or swords, everything becomes part of that um, oral world. Uh, everything is part of the song because yeah, the film I'm... is the song. It's an expression of humanity through song. So when working with a choreographer, right? Mm -hmm. um, was there anything you were looking to explore in your character's movements through dance? Um, always. Um, one's looking to explore the intention of the drama through dance, through the intent, the intention of the the characters, um, how they are in relation to each other. Um, so, for instance, um, in the bakery scene, when um, Cyrano is singing the uh, his love song uh, "Your Name," uh, the dancers, um, the 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 intention of that dance is to create something really sexy. The Cyrano's passion for Roxanne isn't just cerebral, it's not just the intellectual musings of a kind of uh, brilliant mind, but actually there's a physicality to his want and need of her um, that I, 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 I wanted to convey with that dance. The, um, the one with the soldiers, for instance, um, I, I wanted a contrast between their fighting practice, their sword practice, um, uh and 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 sort of drill uh i guess um uh and then they express a complete other side of their nature through the tenderness and delicacy of their movements that 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 show that everyone you know even these big tough soldiers just want someone to love i was wondering specifically are there anything in the movements of each character did you did you end up like um, designing certain ways that each person was were, was dancing, and is there a specific reason why? Yeah, I mean, I think with Kelvin's movement, it was always about Kelvin, who plays Christian, yeah, um, the soldier, and so it was always mm -hmm. about um, making sure that there was a kind of um, strength to his uh, posture that felt uh, kind of militaristic, uh, if you like. Um, Pete had to, you know, we had to really believe that Pete could, could, could slay 10 men um, uh, single handedly. And so that was kind of, but without, you know, coming to, you know, without the use of kind of, um, you know, cliches like ducking um, uh, for a you know, smaller person. Um, uh, and then Roxanne's, we wanted the sense that she was there was something a bit punk about her, that, that she was refusing to conform to the male um, uh, gaze. The, you know, she's refusing to conform to what men want her to be um, and is more angry and, and, and violent and difficult and complicated than that. So making sure that her, 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 her choreography wasn't just kind of pretty, but at times kind of um, ugly in a kind of passionate way. Um, 
Uh, it's one of the things I really loved about Bob Fosse's um, choreography is how Same ugly, here. you know, um, uh, but taking it to the point of beauty. The first line of the movie is, um, is I'm hungry, right? Yeah. And so I, I thought it was really interesting that you chose to use food a lot in your storytelling. And I was wondering what the decision behind that was, because there's a moment where the first line is she's I'm hungry. And then the there's the bakery scene, obviously, which uh, which was amazing. And then there's the make sure he's not hungry. And then uh, and then Cyrano dying on an empty stomach. I was wondering, right. like, what was the choice behind that? Like, is that something that um, was interesting to you. I, I was, thematically, I'd, I'd love to know like how that played into your filming. I, yeah, I mean, I think I'm always interested in our relationship to food. I remember uh, in Pride and Prejudice, uh, Carrie Mulligan's character, um, uh, I made sure that she was always eating um, mm. uh, because somehow I think often in films, they take food out of the world, you know? Um, they also, you know, thankfully take going to the toilet out of the world. But um, uh, I think food is such an integral part of our lives. I want to see it on film. It's like animals. I want to see animals on film. I have dogs. I want to see dogs on film and ducks and chickens and, you know, all of these kind of, and they might be a bit of a pain in the ass to do on the day, you know, oh gosh, I've got to eat another sandwich or, um, but our relationship to, uh, food, I think, is important. I spend a lot of my day thinking about what I'm going to eat. A um, uh, lot of my day. You know, what am I going to have for lunch today? I wonder. Um, and that should be reflected in the movies we make. Yeah, and it adds a real level of a, like, maybe this is not the right word, but sensuality to your yeah. movies, yeah, where totally. it's like, like, especially yeah. in the scene in Pride and Prejudice when uh, uh, Cousin Collins comes over, right? And even... <laughs> The, the the line where he says these are excellent boiled potatoes right like people know what a boiled potato tastes like so it kind of sinks you into that world a tiny yeah. bit further and yeah, i love the way good. like yeah i love the way like even like right down to the end like that last um that last sequence with with uh christian that the only thing he's eating is an apple right like yeah. that's that yeah. even that little apple it's, creates yeah, such a the apple Absolutely. But the apple, if you want to really go there, takes on a kind of metaphorical meaning uh, because it's the apple from the tree of knowledge. Um, and it's at that sequence where he eats of the tree of knowledge. He understands now um, Cyrano's real relationship with Roxanne. And once he eats from the tree of knowledge, he's cast out and um, loses his innocence and is killed. This is this kind of stuff that I'm really excited to hear in the commentary. All about the apple. It's all about the apple. <laughs> it's all about the apple. Um, so, you know, you're really famous in your filmmaking, at least I think so, um, for your designing these very interesting and character-driven oneers, right? And somehow you find a way to fit them into all of your movies. And I was wondering, what does it take to design a oneer for you? Do you rewrite a scene for it to fit? Do you find uh different ways to um to film a certain scene like how does where does it start for you i think really you know there's a certain amount of dreaming that happens uh during pre-production and script development and you're lying on the sofa and you're imagining these scenes and you're imagining this perfect film that you're gonna make but the reality is that a lot of what you're doing is problem solving um you're on set you've got a problem and how am i gonna how am i gonna solve this problem how am i gonna even if it's the kind of thematic problem you know how am i gonna how am i gonna solve the problem of conveying to an audience that pete dinklage can kill 10 men um uh unaided right um, and so the solution to that problem uh, might be that um, you do it in a one so that the audience are right there and there's no, you know, even if they're not aware that it's a one they're subconsciously aware that there are no tricks, that you haven't cut, that you've just stayed with him um, relentlessly and followed him 
and his every move. And so it's a solution to a problem. Um, when you're when you're then designing that shot, you're going, okay, you have a series of problems. How do I get from here to there? How does he do that? How do we um, actually hide that moment because that doesn't work, but I need him to come around there and as a surprise. And so it's basically just you're going step by step by step through the process and solving multiple, multiple problems until you arrive at a cohesive whole. And then you look back at it and then you figure out, you know, where it's working, where it's not working. Am I expressing the intention? Should I throw the whole thing away and start again? Um, it's really about, it's really about problem solving. Prior to that, there's been a process through the development of the movie uh, sitting in this room uh, where I've steeped myself so uh, completely in the story and in the characters and in the themes that I want to express that as I'm solving those problems, those themes and ideas are being expressed without me really thinking about it because I'm so in the film. Yeah, is that how you know when it's working, when you feel like it is it is performing the theme or the or this like 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 you said the sense of connecting like you're feeling this is working because i can feel the theme throughout the shot um yeah maybe maybe some of that and maybe also i'm looking back at it going well you know i'm not bored yeah I'm never yeah. bored with them. Games. I mean, even like- I mean, like, games. I want to know what happens next. I want to know what happens next. Is there a conflict? Yeah. Is there a drama? Is there, um, is there beauty? Is there intention? Are the intentions yeah. being um, articulated? Yeah. One of the things that I really loved in Pride and Prejudice is that very first shot when we meet Lizzie and then you end the one on this like shot of her looking through a window. And I always yeah. tell people, and may, you can tell me if I'm wrong, finally. Um, I always tell people, because this this movie is very much from her perspective. It's through her window we're seeing things. It's through her prejudice, right? And so I love yeah. that each of the wonders in that movie always starts on Lizzie and ends on her, no matter yeah. what. And yeah. I really I really like that like attention to uh, character detail in wonders. Is there anything as a filmmaker that you learned from the production and and coming up with Cyrano that you're going to take now, um, is there anything you learn that you're going to take into your next project? Every film I make is a is a process of learning. Um, I don't make films about what I know. I make films about what I want to know. Um, and I get through the process of making a movie to learn. Um, I get to learn all sorts of things about filmmaking, but about the world and culture and people in general. Um, and the problem is, is that I never really know what it is that I've learned until I get to put it in practice. Mm. Um, and then I find myself on the next movie or the next situation in life where I go, oh, I remember that and that worked or that didn't work. So I'm not going to do that again. I'm going to try something else or so on. So. Um, but I think, I think one of the things I learned is never to shoot up a live active volcano. <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna take that's, that. a, that, that's the lesson I'll take on my next film is like no volcanoes on this shoot. God damn it. You heard it from <laughs> me. You heard it from me first. So the next time you're making your movie, Think about what it means to add an extra layer of meaning to your shots. Is your shot engaging you at every level? Think about how the audience is reacting to your shot and how much information you're conveying to them. And as always, if you like the video, please like and subscribe and we'll see you in the next one.